study on the last words of Christ on the cross. If you have your Bibles, take with, with and turn with me, if you would, to the Gospel of John, chapter 19. Uh, John, chapter 19, verse 28. Uh, it's the Pew Bible there. It's page 1248. We'll be focusing today on the fifth saying of Christ while he was on the cross. Uh, just as a quick review, the first week uh, we saw the words of Christ as he looked upon those that were the malefactors, those who were uh, making all of the accusations and, of course, involved in all of the activities around the cross. And he simply said, Father, forgive them, uh, for they do not know what they do. Uh, the second week we took a look uh, today, uh, Thou shalt be with me in paradise, as he spoke to the thief on the cross. And uh, the penitent thief uh, was ushered into eternity with Almighty God. The third saying uh, from the cross, very simply, as we took a look at the family matters, uh, Jesus was concerned about his mom, and uh, so he gave her care uh, over to John, the beloved disciple. He says, Woman, behold thy son. And then he said, Son, behold uh, your mother. And so from that day forward, John took care of his mother. And then last week, uh, the essence of the aspect of holiness uh, when Jesus says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, God himself turning his back on his own son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And here in John chapter 19, verse 28, uh, we find the next saying of the Lord Jesus Christ as he was hanging on the cross. And in verse 28, we read, After this Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I thirst. And so the fifth aspect and the fifth if you would, saying of the Lord or the little phrase of Christ on the cross is simply, I thirst. For the Jews, uh, let's just remember, uh, their day began at 6 a.m. Christ was crucified uh, at 9 a.m. And he hung upon the cross uh, mm -hmm. until he died uh, around the ninth hour, which would have been about 3 o'clock uh, in the afternoon. And in those hours, uh, we've been studying what the Lord Jesus Christ had to say uh, as he was on the cross and the significance of each of those for us. Jesus fulfills, and I'm going to ask if you would to go back just a few chapters to John chapter 3. In this time, uh, Jesus is fulfilling uh, what he promised when he spoke to uh, the disciples and certainly when he spoke uh, to Nicodemus here in John chapter 3. And in John chapter 3, the Lord Jesus Christ is fulfilling the promise uh, in verse 14 where we read, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Why? Verse 15, That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have what, church? Eternal, Eternal life. And so we understand Jesus is sharing here, uh, if you would, a reference back to Numbers chapter 21, if you'd like to uh, look at that sometime this week if you're not familiar with it. But in Numbers chapter 21, verse 9, you'll remember the children of Israel were murmuring against God, they were murmuring against Moses, and so God sent fiery serpents into their midst, and uh, when they were bitten uh, by those fiery serpents, they died. And there were thousands and thousands of Israelites who died during that particular time. And then God instructed Moses, as we said there in Numbers chapter 21, he made a, uh, a serpent, if you would, out of bronze, a brazen serpent, and he hung it up on a pole. And once the Israelites looked upon that uh, as they were bitten, then they would be healed. And so this is the reference here in John chapter 3, verse 15, or excuse me, verse 14, that Jesus is talking about as Moses lifted up the serpent uh, in the wilderness. Now, on this same mountain uh, that God commanded Abraham back in Genesis chapter 22, uh, God is now offering his own beloved son. Uh, you recall there in Genesis 22, that was the offering of Isaac uh, by Abraham to Almighty God. And on the same mountain now, God is going to, uh, if you would, offer his own beloved son. However, this time, Isaac was spared, but Jesus is not spared. And it's because of that we have eternal life. And I trust and pray that as God's people, we're grateful for that. Amen? We're grateful for what he has done. So Jesus, the Son of God, becomes the perfect Lamb of God, and this blood is the final sacrifice. And as you think about somebody who is hanging on that cross, um, the, the holy blood, if you would, of the Lord Jesus Christ draining from his body, all of these circumstances that we'll talk about here in a few moments, 
uh, certainly take away from him. And uh, in Jesus' response, if you'll notice in verse 29 uh, of your text there in John chapter 19, it says, a vessel full of sour wine, that would be vinegar, was sitting there. They filled a sponge with it, and they put it on a hyssop, and they put it to the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ. So in response uh, to Jesus' cry of physical thirst, uh, we'll see the implications of spiritual thirst in a few moments. But in response to that, it's almost like a disrespectful, uh, if you would, a treating of the Lord Jesus Christ here. Certainly, uh, you would expect uh, that in that time, it would have been something that would have been more of a flavorful wine, something that would have been uh, more pleasurable to the palate. Uh, and yet they use the sour vinegar at this particular time. And if, but let's keep in mind, no drink uh, can satisfy the thirst of a dying person. And so we have the Lord Jesus Christ here. And just as he says in John chapter 6, verse 35, He that believeth on me shall never thirst. Here we have the Lord Jesus Christ humanly uh, dying on the cross as, uh, if you would, a thirsty man. So I want you to think a little bit about this element of physical thirst for just a few moments. Water is probably described uh, as the most valuable uh, resource we have on the earth. We just mentioned to you in our prayer time uh, about our brother Kenya. In, in Kenya and Uganda there, brother Wilson Mongo, and the need for water. The, the human body, uh, most of you that have gone through any science classes, you know that your body is made up of about what percentage? What part of your body is water, church? You know? It's about two-thirds of it, all right? So, so think about that. Uh, here we have water on almost three quarters of the earth, uh, and yet uh, water is a very significant source. It's sometimes a, a problem. Uh, you, you need, and I need, uh, and we need about two and a half quarts of water every day to function properly. I would imagine most of us do not drink that much water. We would much rather have other types of beverages like iced tea. We say, oh, well, there's water in iced tea, right? or there's water in our Pepsi or whatever other drinks you might have. You know, the body can survive up to 40 days without food, but only five days without water. It's a very, very significant, very important part of our, of our makeup. So if you consider that water is, is so essential in the physical realm, it, it makes sense that it's going to be important in the spiritual realm. And again, I would reference to you John chapter 6, verse 35, where Jesus is speaking there, and he says, if you believe on me, you will never hunger and you will never what? Thirst. It, it's got to be a spiritual thirsting. He's not talking about providing the physical water there. This spiritual thirsting is fulfilled as a result of our, of our walk in Christ. I mean, we all know that probably the most immediate need that you have in the human body is oxygen. Uh, but certainly the most or the second important would be water. And the historians tell us that when somebody was crucified on the cross, it was very, very agonizing. And as they hung on the cross, there would be that, uh, if you would, releasing of the, of the fluids from the body without any type of drinking. It was a very, very cruel way to die. Keep in mind, too, um, with the Lord Jesus Christ suffering there during those hours, that would have been the hottest part of the day. So you, you have the body constantly, if you would, excreting the fluids without anything that is coming uh, back into it. The tongues would swell. Um, uh, uh, in the mouth and the thirst was terrible and if you if you reflect back on what's taken place up to this point Jesus could have gone without drinking for almost 18 hours uh, if you think about going back to all of the aspects of what's taken place um, it's, it's unlikely today uh, like what you would see, you know, somebody that gets arrested uh, on TV, you see a TV show or whatever, it almost, um, almost immediately they say, well, can I have something to drink? Or can I have something to eat? In this day, uh, they treated criminals very, very cruelly. So it's possible that the Lord had gone even up to 18 hours uh, without any type of water or any type of intake of fluid. So this is, again, a very, very terrible, very, very, very difficult thing. So I want you to take a look for a few moments because the significant... Um, the fulfillment of Christ in this physical aspect of water. Again, look at verse 28. And in verse 28, you'll notice, even before the words of, the Christ, of Christ, it says, Knowing this, all things were now accomplished. That next phrase is very significant. That the scripture might be what? Fulfilled. In Jesus' lifetime, he fulfilled some 330 prophecies from the Old Testament. It would be an interesting study for you to go back to the Old Testament 
uh, and even through the beginning parts of the Gospels, and, and read all of the prophecies of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I have been a math teacher, uh, had been a math teacher for many years, and every once in a while I get a call to help some people out uh, with math, and I have to kind of brush the cobwebs off a little bit. Uh, but I, I may have shared this years and years ago, but uh, it, I was always, I've always been amazed by statistics and, and so on. And there was a, a mathematician and a scientist, his name was Peter Stoner. And he did a study on what would it be like if just eight, now catch this, Jesus fulfilled, I said, about how many prophecies? About 330. He did a mathematical study, a scientific study, of what would it take for Jesus to fulfill eight, just eight of the Old Testament prophecies? How does it work mathematically? And, and I found it very, very interesting. So I want to share that with you um, for just a moment, uh, just so I can get all of the facts uh, straight here and so on and so forth. But he found that the chances of that happening was one in 10 to the 17th power. Now, any of you mathematicians in here can tell me what that is? That's one in 100 quadrillion chances. Think about that. Let me help you understand it. This is what Peter Stoner uh, came up with. I thought it was very interesting. He said, if you covered the state of Texas, state of Texas, very large, right? If you covered the state of Texas with 100 quadrillion silver dollars, it would be almost two feet deep over the state of Texas. Now, if just one of these was fulfilled, here's how he figured it out. Take one of those silver dollars and put a mark on it, such as an X or whatever you want to do. Mix all of them up, throw them all over the entire state of Texas. Then take a blind man or take a man and put a blindfold on him and release him into the state of Texas. The chances of him finding that one point are one in 100 quadrillion. Think about that in terms of prophecy. That Christ fulfilled all of the prophecies that are given to him in scripture. Only God can do that, church. There's no way even mathematically or physically we can do that. So let me just remind you of this. Christ fulfills all of the scripture. And what God declares in this Bible, what he declares in his word is going to come to pass. Do you believe that? Amen. All right. So if you believe the Bible, you're going to believe that this is going to take place. There will be judgment to come on those who do not believe. There will be eternity for those of us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, so you, you, either, you either believe it. And, and during our lifetime, throughout the scriptures, the Lord God is going to be present with us at all times. And that's why when you think about this physical aspect of thirst here in John chapter 19, it's so significant. Because as, as a believer, I, I understand a little bit about the fact of the physical stress of Christ. And it's interesting that this is the only word that was spoken by Christ with regards to his physical problems. He had a crown crushed on his head. He was beaten. He was scourged. We read no account anywhere where Jesus says, oh, my head hurts or my back hurts. There's no reference to any of those physical things. And yet there is a significant, if you would, recognition of thirst by the Lord Jesus Christ. And here in verse 28, again, he says, this was done so that it would fulfill Scripture. So rather than them offering, if you would, a taste of, of good wine in those passing hours, they gave him sour vinegar. And you say, well, what's the significance of that? Last week we looked at Psalm chapter 22, verse 1. And in verse 1 we have the prophecy, if you would. We have the words of Christ that are repeated there. My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? In Psalm chapter 22, it's very interesting. In verse 15, here's what we read. My tongue clings to my jaw. The very, if you would, remembering or just a, a, an illustration of what happens to somebody who hangs on the cross. And then in Psalm chapter 69, verse 21, listen to the prophecy. My thirst, and for my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. Now, the reason it's significant, church, is because when you, when you read the scriptures, 
and you understand or you study the Word of God, you need to know this. This is all of God talking to us. This is all of God speaking to us. So when we read something in the Old Testament, and then it's prophesied, it's fulfilled in the New Testament, that gives us even greater assurance that this is the Word of God. And, and we ought to be thankful for that. I'm going to ask you to go back just to, uh, to the book of Matthew for just a moment. Chapter 27. In Matthew chapter 27, and again, we'll see the significance of this in just a moment. In Matthew chapter 27, Jesus was also offered a drink of vinegar at another point in his time of suffering. And in Matthew chapter 27, I want you to look at verses 33 and 34. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 27 Verses 33 and 34. It says, They came to the place called Golgotha, that is to say, the place of a skull. And notice what they did. They gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink. But when he had tasted it, he did what? He would not drink it. Why? Because the fulfillment of of the drinking of that vinegar, all of the spiritual aspects of that took place on the cross. It did not take place prior to that. And they offered that to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so back to your text there in John chapter 19, verse 28, you have the fulfillment of this prophecy that was told about the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's very, very important. So let's take a look for a few moments here at the spiritual element of thirsty as we think about it in terms of Scripture. Uh, again, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to go back to the Old Testament, to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 53, Isaiah chapter 53, as we think about the spiritual element of thirst for the Lord, and, and also for us, this is the application to us as well, but here in Isaiah chapter 53, look at the, look at the prophecy of the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah chapter 53, let's go down to verse 10. And we know a lot of the other verses talk about that. Uh, specifically, we read verses 4 through 6 a lot. But let's look at verse 10. It says, It pleased the Lord to bruise him. And again, you'll notice it's capitalized there. Correct, church? So we're talking about the Lord here. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him, God has put him to grief. And when you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Now notice verse 11. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their what? Their iniquities or their sin. You see, the spiritual aspect... Uh, just first of all, the obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ. We recall the Garden of Gethsemane. I think, I think most of you, you, you remember what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. But as the Lord Jesus Christ was there and he's praying in the garden, his prayer, he's wrestling with the pain, he's wrestling with all the things that are going on about him. And in his prayer to Almighty God, his Father, he says what? If it is willing, if you are willing, let this cup of suffering do what? Depart from me. And then the rest of the verse says, But not my will, your will be done. Jesus was obedient, as we know, even to the death of the cross. Philippians chapter 2, verse 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he, Christ, did what? Humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Jesus Christ was obedient to everything that his father was doing. He forfeited the glories of heaven. He forfeited all, if you would, even the glories or shall we say the comforts or the, the physical things here as he's hanging on the cross. He forfeited all of that for you. He forfeited all of that for me. And, and Jesus satisfies the spiritual thirst of man. Go to John chapter 4, and I'll just remind you of, of this instance in the Lord's teaching and in this particular case, um, he was uh, interacting with the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. And Jesus is going to satisfy. He is not only the obedient servant of God. He not only obeyed everything that his father told him to do. He not only did everything he knew that he needed to. But Jesus satisfies the spiritual thirst that we have. Um, if, you, if you recall here in John chapter 4, let's just, this, this is the interaction with the Samaritan woman. Okay, and she comes and, and uh, 
If you're not familiar with all of it, the Lord Jesus Christ begins to speak to her. He addresses her, talks to her about water. He asked her to give him a, a water drink. And the reason it was so odd was because she being a Samaritan, he a Jew, they never had any intermingling together. But I want you to draw your attention to verse 7 of John chapter 4. Beginning in verse 7, this woman of Samaria comes to draw water. Jesus says, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And then the woman of Samaria said, how is it that you being a Jew ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? Because the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Now notice what Jesus says. If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you what type of water? living water. Here's the spiritual application of this thirsting, this water. The woman says to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well? And, you, and he drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock, his cattle. Verse 13, Jesus says, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. Um, those of us that, if, if you've ever been very, very thirsty, you drink a little bit of water, you, you want more water. You, you want more water, you want that to satisfy the thirst. Jesus talked about the physical part there. Look what he says in verse 14. Whoever drinks of the water that I give him will what? Yes. Spiritual <coughs> water. The spiritual aspect of Christ. He will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into what? Everlasting life. Jesus is declaring here to this woman that he is the living water. He is the one who provides the spiritual life. Now, drop down to verse 23 and verse 24. Because what happens then, this spiritual thirst pushes her into true worship. An understanding of what true worship is all about. Jesus is describing it to her in verse 23. Because she's talking about going to a certain place to worship like the fathers did. Jesus says the hour is coming and it now is because he's there. The now is when the true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and in truth. For the father is seeking such to worship him. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. He gives her a discourse on what true worship really is. And so, I, I guess, church, here's, here's the question I have for us today. All right? When, when we think about this thirsting of the Lord Jesus Christ, we think about this thirsting in, in our life, what is our worship really like? What, what is our worship really like? Whether it be at home by ourselves, whether it be with somebody else in our family or a small group, or whether it be on a Sunday morning, what is, what is our worship really like? Do you recall the song that's based on Psalm chapter 42, verses 1 and 2? As the deer panteth for the water, the psalmist says, so what? So my soul, so soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. Th this idea of thirsting, if I'm going to make an application to us as a believer, okay, so we understand Jesus is fulfilling Scripture Jesus is, is, is fulfilling what his, his Father has called him to do. And, and if we're going to make a spiritual application to it, then understand this. It's Christ who satisfies the, the physical, or excuse me, the spiritual sense of water that we need in our life. The, there has to be, church, that point in my life where I say, I, am, am I really like that deer? Am I really the type of believer who is panting, if you would, who has that, such a desire for, for the things of God. Um, I've hunted. I've been in the woods many times. And I've seen deer uh, from a long distance off. Running as fast as they can. But the interesting thing about deer is they can go very fast for a short period of time. But then they'll stop. And if you've ever been in the woods and you've ever witnessed that before. You've witnessed the deer panting. The tongue hanging out. The, 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 in the cold weather, you see the, the, the nostrils, you see that smoke, and so on and so forth. That, that type of panting, that type of picture for, for, for the Christian. So the question is, when I enter my personal time with God, and I, and I trust you have your personal time with God every day. Um, I, I don't know when you do yours, or if you, know, if you, if you don't, church, you're not going to grow in your relationship with God unless you're spending time with Him by yourself. All right, it's just it's just not going to happen. 
Um, husbands and wives, you can spend time together. Uh, you know, if you're, you work your schedules out or you do it with your kids or whatever, there, there has to be that time uh, that you're spending in God's house. And when you come into church on a Sunday morning uh, or you go into a Bible study, you know, and that, that worship and that, that study, are, are you panting for more knowledge of God? Are you, are you worshiping Him with all, as the scriptures say, all your heart, your what? Your soul and your mind. Is it, is it overtaking you? So, if, if you can make a, a spiritual application of what Jesus is talking about here in the physical realm of thirsting, if we can somehow draw that into our personal lives where I say, that's the type of thirsting that I have. That's the type of, of desire that I have. Most of us sitting here in this room have some type of a hobby, some type of thing that we're really interested in. I see some, some uh, young people that are sitting here that are really into softball. And, and, and they, they, they practice softball. They practice it six, seven days a week. We have uh, one girl in our church who um, has gotten a scholarship because of softball. And she plays all the time, all winter long. They go to, they go to a, I don't know what you would call it. I don't know, it's an indoor facility. <laughs> Play, play all year long. That, there, that is a thirsting for that sport. That, that is a thirsting and a desire, a desire that's in that person's body and in their heart and in their soul to be the best that they can in that particular area. And I would imagine all of us have something along that line in our, in, in our own particular lives. Ask yourself the question, do you have that same, same thirsting, that same desire for your walk with God? It is, is it just as, just as important in your life? Or, or are there too many distractions that are pulling you away from your worship with God? Whether it be in church on a Sunday morning, you know, are you a doodler? Or are you focusing and worshiping God? You know, where, where, where are our thoughts? Where is our time in, in God? I think there are two things that this, this element of obedience and worship uh, in my life. One, one it'll bring a personal, I, I have to understand, my personal walk with God has to be something that uh, it, it, it's every day. His presence is there. I'm thirsting for it. I have that desire for it. Because church, if you're doing that, and if I'm doing that, then it'll keep me from sin. Because I'm focusing on the things of God. And, I, and I'm obeying Him. And secondly, we have to have a, a realistic view of sin in our life. We've talked about this many times. Uh, you know, um, John Piper put it this way. I thought this was an interesting quote. The power of sin is the false promise that it will bring more happiness than holiness will bring. We, we, we have to understand how important it is to realize when there's sin in our life. If, 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 the, if the sin is there, I have to understand how important it is that I want to have that desire to walk. That self-examination. We talk about that whenever we take the Lord's table. It needs to be something that's done continually in my life. So, so that I have that, that thirsty. It's, this thirsting is a poignant reminder, if you would, that no matter what the cost is, I've been called to a life of obedience for Almighty God. And, and I want to have that desire. Christ fulfilled the will of His Father as He hung there on the cross. The scriptures there in verse 28 says, He fulfilled scripture. He, he fulfilled the things that were prophesied about Him when He hung on the cross. So as a believer, I have to understand, where is my thirst to the Lord? Where is it going to be revealed in my life? Is it going to be revealed in this church? Is it going to be revealed in this community? Is the community going to see your thirst for Almighty God? Or is it just a, a, a thing of convenience? You know, we, we say this a lot of times, but I, I, would, I would encourage you to get, you, you need to have some type of, of group study, if you would, whether it be in a home, you get a few people together, you study God's Word, um, or whether it be in a Bible study here on, on Wednesday nights or whenever we have them on Saturdays or whatever it might be, or Sunday mornings at 9.30, where, where you're, you, are, you are searching after the things of God. Um, let, me, let me just close by taking you what Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 4, because I think it's, it's important to be reminded of this as, as we think about our walk with the Lord every day. Ephesians chapter 4. He, he starts out in this chapter by giving us a kind of like a challenge to the church. He's talking to the church of Ephesus here. Uh, and he says in the first six verses, 
as the prisoner of the Lord, if you'll notice there, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you are called. So you, you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Is your walk worthy of that calling? Do so with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing each other in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Why? Because there's one body, there's one Spirit. And just as you were called in one hope of your calling, there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Drop down to verse 11. And so what did Christ do? He gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors, some to be teachers. Why? Verse 12. For the equipment of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to be a perfect or mature man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of God. Why is that so important? How does that take place? Why? Look at verse 14. Why is it so important? That you have this thirsting for God. That you have this thirsting for the walk with God. Because, verse 14, Paul says, the reason it's so important is so that you would no longer be like a child who gets tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but rather you would speak the truth in love so that you could grow up in all things unto Him who is the head speaking of the head of the body, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Church, we are living in a day when the scriptures are being perverted. Churches are going away from the teaching of God's word. We mentioned prophecy a little bit later, uh, a little bit earlier in the message. There is no new prophecy by man today. There is no new prophecy. This is God's prophetic word. This is what we live by. And yet we have those who would say that they are prophets and they're gonna give you some new teaching from God. This is the whole counsel of Almighty God, church. And that's not only the only area, but there are so many areas of false teaching and so on. And Paul says, you have to, you have to be focusing on that thirsting. You have to have that desire to want to know God better so that your knowledge of God is better so that you can then see what's wrong that's out there so that you can you can live by the promises of Almighty God. I, I just trust that we would be challenged, you know, as, as Jesus fulfilled what he was called to do, that I would have the same type, if you would, of that thirsting, that desire in the spiritual realm to want to be what God would have me to be in every area of my life, whatever it might be. Um, whether it be in your daily walk as a, in your job or whether it be in, in the way that you live your life, whatever it might be. Just might that idea of the thirsting and that desire for God be something that overtakes us in all this. So that we can say, you know, when we think about God, He is holy, 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 right? Uh, as we sang a little while ago. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Might that thirst and that desire uh, be something that focuses it in. So, so we can learn, if you would today, uh, from this saying of Christ, uh, just to make the application to us, that we indeed would have that spiritual thirsting as the deer pants for the water. Might we so, if you would, pant or desire for Almighty God. Might that be your desire, church, as we go from this house. Father, I pray that you would challenge us to, to have thirsty souls, to have thirsty minds, to have a desire to, to learn and to grow uh, in our walk with you. And I pray, Father, that you would not allow anything to hinder that. Uh, Father, I pray that there would be nothing that would stand in the way of that. And if there are things in our lives that are keeping us from that uh, st striving, if you would, or, or that desire, or that thirsting for things of the Lord, I pray, Father, that you would take them away. I, I pray that we would have the, the heart's desire to want to walk with you. And, Father, might we give you the glory as a result of it. We praise you, we thank you, Heavenly Father, for who you are and for what you have done. Thank you for the words of Christ on the cross. Thank you that even in this, this small phrase of thirsting and the fact that God, or Jesus Christ himself, was obedient as a servant to you. And then, Father, the spiritual applications of thirsting in our life, uh, might they teach us and might they challenge us as we go from your house today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.